Hi everybody, welcome to season two, episode 28 of the Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry podcast with me, Philip Heidson and Darren McAnthony, chairman and co-owner of Peterborough United. And apologies, first of all, to everybody for the uh, delay for a couple of weeks. I'm going to take the uh, blame for that one, being away. I got back this morning. So, uh, Dara, it's been a pretty crappy weekend. I think it's fair to say. How are you holding up? Uh, I'm, I'm okay, actually. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, obviously you've been away for a couple of weeks. You've missed, yeah. you know, typical back-to-back wins. You know, some optimism would have been of a good Of course, the only time like I go away, you start winning. Yeah, we would have done a really good podcast last Tuesday about the miracle and, you know, the Easter resurrection um, and all of that. Um, so kind of like, uh, you know, you're waiting for the shoot the other on the foot to drop, as they yeah. say, thing goes, you know. So it was a tough ask. Um, obviously, Hull did their job. You expect, you know, Reading obviously had two 95-minute goals over the, the, the Easter weekend. I think if that hadn't happened, might luck have intervened with the Forest game, potentially. Mm-hmm. So, you know, because you're talking about three points in difference or whatever it would have been. So that would have made it four points. Yeah, I mean, you'd you'd climbed up, you'd, you'd clawed back some points in the last yeah, couple of games yeah, before, yeah. That, hadn't you? Yeah, and then Reading just doing that, obviously, after we win right on full time in both games, you know, is what it is. But look, when you put yourself in that situation, that's to be expected. And, and it was just unsurmountable. And, and the lads gave it a good go. Um, we played a Forest team that have won 25 points from the last 10 games, which puts the best team in the championship. Fulham are the best, are the champions, will be the champions, but you fancy Forest for the playoffs, you know, and, and the game on Saturday, a sellout crowd, um, great atmosphere, a few things happened at the end that were naughty, you know, the stewards had to intervene, I think about, before the game, we got rid of about 300 Forest fans and somehow used postcodes to get into the grounds and mm-hmm. unfortunately, some still got in, there was a flag incident, I've, I've reached out to the gentleman whose daughter was, was involved in all of that, was very traumatised by it, so I'm really, really apologetic about that. Uh, I'm going to meet her and her dad before the Blackpool game while I'm still mm-hmm. here and just apologise directly. And we've got to like up our game and that shit, Stuart. You, we can't let that crap go on. Um, the game was was a good game. We should have been 1-0 up uh, by half time. Ricky spun in and, and took out their defenders and was one-on-one and unfortunately missed a chance. That's okay, he's 19. Um, you know, it was one of them games where we really dug in. We weren't at our best in the final third. We had most of the action in the second half in the final third. Forrest got a bit of a scare, I think. Um, so it was, to, it is what it is. We left it too late. Ultimately, our home form just killed us this season. We've been brilliant for two years at home, and uh, it just it caught up with us this season. Our home forms go into all the other bits and pieces about why we didn't stay in the championship. But being so crap at home definitely hasn't helped because our home form last year and the year before brilliant. This year under for and even under the new gaffer home form, I think one win and seven or whatever at home, it just hasn't been good enough. So. Yeah, disappointment, obviously very much so full time, um, you know, but expected. So probably not as disappointed as say that it happened suddenly out of the blue, like eight, nine years ago, what happened? Do you know what I mean? So it was kind of like you could see it coming down the pipe. And then obviously the, the fun and games start afterwards, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah you know. That, so uh, now the post mortem begins, and it yeah. didn't take long after full time for you to uh, start yeah. getting some uh, some pretty nasty tweets, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just hand over to Jason and Randy and, you know, time to leave and do the, do the, do. Yeah, tough, I guess, because, you know, you spend 15 years slogging your guts out for the club. And obviously this year as well, yes, it hasn't gone well, but I've, it's never been short of effort for me from a time uh, investment issue. I invest a lot of time, as you know. I miss a lot of stuff at home. Um, you know, and I, I posted on Instagram earlier, my daughter won a volleyball tournament the weekend with her team. And I, she said to me last week, you've not been to one of my games this season, you know, because they've always coincided with me going to a posh thing in England or posh, you know, it's, it's just never worked out. And, you know, and you look at that and you go, fuck me almighty, I'm missing that. I'm getting battered by people, you know, who spend all their time with their families. And it's just like, really? My missus said to me this morning, like, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how your mental health is so good, you know, because she she's even getting shit sent to her a couple of on Instagram they get stuff and I'm just like ignore it don't bite don't bite don't bite down on it um let me handle it I'll put it on my back and uh yeah it's um yeah it's a bit sobering this weekend you know as regard not the relegation but the stuff that's come afterwards you know I wish I could pull a shirt on and and play myself but I can't um (laughs) you know but trust me um a dead leg or a (laughs) a, a issue with a family pet wouldn't stop me playing um 
because you know that's who I am. That's what yeah. I am. And uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, really, really, uh, yeah, difficult, difficult. I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it. You know, you ask away, and I'll answer. Yeah, you know, as uh, it's it's. Um... I was looking through social media afterwards and it obviously wasn't pretty. Some of the things that were being said, and I think a lot of things that were said in the moment, one of the things that really did surprise me was the article by Alan Swan that came hot on the heels of, um, of relegation. It was basically, um, you know, talking about the process as being as trustworthy as Boris Johnson, I think was the headline. Um, you know, and I read this article and it just seemed like it was just piling on you know, and looking for a scapegoat. Um, and almost there was glee in, in the way it was written that I told you so. Um, I'm sure you've seen that article. I just well, you, you, It was really funny. You and a friend of mine, Ian, I hadn't actually, because to be fair, the, the, the tweet that came at me on Saturday, it was someone else who, who it, it was actually my missus said, oh, you, this tweet is up, you know, because I was like, this, I'll stay off social media, it'd be toxic. And obviously, I, I you know, I bet um, the call the person who did it a clown. Um, and then obviously the article, um, I was sent it by you and another person called Ian saying, fuck me. I mean, talk about someone who's written this article probably three weeks ago, right. and with their finger hovering over the press button. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can't wait to send this the minute they're confirmed as relegated. I could see him there beating off behind his computer screen, just saying, wait, hey, the excitement. You know, this is like, I told you so, fuck you. You know what I mean? And then obviously you know, uh, taking pot shots at the podcast, which is filled up with fucking newspaper half of the year, um, you know, and, and it was, yeah, it was very gleeful. Um, what can I say? I, I, for 15 years, I've had a really, really good relationship with the local press. Um, I've always tried to be gracious. I've always tried to be good with my time. I've always tried to give them whatever they've needed. Um, and I would never ban media or press from covering the posh. I don't, I'm against all that crap, regardless of what they write about me. That's just the way it is. And and Swan, Swanee is allowed, you know, write his opinions. You know, that's what the freedom of press is all about. And we live in a day and age now where a lot of that's been stifled and stopped. So um, the press locally have definitely turned on me this season in a big way. And BBC, if you listen to enough posh games, the commentary, if you listen, to, I think they have a show on at six o'clock tonight. They've been highlighting little snippets of where whether it's Fanny Green or Gabby Zaquani, you know, people who've actually needed me and asked for favours at times sometimes um, are, you know, digging into it. And it's, it's yes, yeah, scapegoat time, I guess. So recruitment, recruitment, recruitment. Um, and Alan Swan's done it. And, yeah, so that's the local press. They've turned. Um, it's taken 15 years, so I suppose it's been a good run. Um, and, uh, yeah, they've got um, small memories. And um, I guess that's the way it is, right? What can, what can I do? Yeah, it's... What it's ironic, I... you know, some of the some of the things that were written in there were actually things that have been talked about throughout the season that, you sure. know, there's kind of mitigants to them. Sure. Um, I tell you something, I'm not I'm not going to start with the football. Sure. I want to start with um, there was talk about um, wages, paying mm-hmm. director of football, you know, paying Barry over three hundred um thousand pounds was referenced in there as like a reason why that money should have been as if that money should have been spent somewhere else and having a ceo salary advertised with 150 grand and those like popped out to me as being like why would you even so you know you're trying to create scapegoats now out of people who are taking wages that they yeah. have earned and deserve yeah plus uh, plus you plus you call it fake news so I, I i didn't actually read the full article and see that bit there but he should retract those because Barry's on a salary of, I want to say, and you, know, you won't mind me saying this, but I'm going to defend him £100,000. And then he has incentives and bonuses and he gets a cut when he goes down. Um, so the 300 grand figure is nonsense. You can say he got it from the accounts, but that just doesn't mean Barry, there's other directors at the club who get paid. Um, and then to the CEO, again, if you look at the advert for the job, it was 150, including bonuses. And his basics a lot less than that. He's probably one of the lowest paid CEOs in the championship, which has always been the way. Because we are fucking Peterborough United, not Manchester United. So to to go into that, look, I'm happy to take all of my shoulders. Leave leave people like that alone. You're going after nearly an 80 year old man um, who works his fucking arse off for the club, and you're going after now a CEO who's brand new through the door. Um, I don't fucking get it. Um, so again, maybe you're trying to fill up space. Maybe it's just who, who fucking knows. I don't you, understand. You know what? What I want to say about salaries like that too is like this is the real world and CEO salaries uh, uh, are typically many multiples higher 
than the numbers that were quoted in the article. And I've seen it all over social media as well, as if, well, if we didn't pay 150 grand, you know, the number that's quoted, then all of a sudden it means that there's more money available for players or it's taken away from the transfer kitty or something like that. Whereas, you know, salaries in, in professional jobs at a, a mid-level will be at that or above. Never mind a CEO level. So absolutely, absolutely. Look, we we run our football club really prudently, and of course, we don't run it cheapskate wise. Um, but we run it within what we feel we can do. And at the end of the day, but to put that in an article to do a relegation and whatever, re- I, I I don't know why it's in there. Um, so that from that point of view, that's just a bunch of bullshit. Yeah, so, something else I want to bring up is uh, Darren. And there was a, a point made, uh, well, Posh at least saved money when manager Darren Ferguson resigned rather than waited to be sacked. And there's a couple of things related to that. One is, you know, there's all this about, well, Darren, why was he given a three-year contract, um, you know, halfway through the season? And as we talked about on the pod, sure. uh, when it happened, that was actually a promise that was made uh, after great. promotion. Absolutely. And, and, and if people don't like the fact I'm a man of my word and I stick to my promises, well, then, you know, I'm definitely the wrong person for the job. And that was an agreement that was made long before it was signed in October, November. And it was agreed to leave it till then for many different reasons, nothing to do with league form or whatever else. And that is the measure of the man. He did resign without getting paid. And there was never a reason not to fire Darren Ferguson. I fired enough managers over the time. And the previous two times I've paid him when he's got fired. And that's always been the way. I wouldn't have stopped us firing Darren Ferguson. It wasn't a financial decision. And Mm -hmm. people can look back and go, yes, it was a mistake not to sack him earlier. But I just feel loyalty is short in football as shown with the local media in Peterborough, um, that, you know, it's very easy to be disloyal and discard somebody after the terrific work they've done through a pandemic. And I think everyone's forgetting, you know, they all think the relegation is terrible and the worst thing to happen. It's not. The worst thing to happen was the point, the vote that took away our season and the pandemic shutting down our football club and putting us all in peril financially, as well as obviously the older fans and the the, the, uh, fans we have. You know, we were at a stage where none of the owners knew how their own business were going to be affected when the world was shut down. We had a football club hemorrhaging money because there was no help and no fans coming into the stadium because of the government and the lack of help. Um, that was the worst point for me. And then to be told the season was over after all the money they'd been invested. So this isn't the worst thing to happen by a long shot. And I had a manager who steadied the ship through that and was as loyal as anyone can be um, who didn't want to get paid through that pandemic at the start. And, and worked with us to make sure the club was still there when we got going again. Mm-hmm. So to suddenly discard them four months after a fucking promotion would have been the most disgusting thing to ever do running a football club. And I'm glad I didn't do it. So pay the price of a relegation for it? Fine, I'll take it on the chin because I felt it was the right thing to do. If you want someone else in charge of your club, and that may happen, who would turn around and treat someone like shit like that and get rid of them four months afterwards, after what they did through a pandemic, mm-hmm. Well, more fool you. Um, and if that's how the local media feel and the local press feel, it should have happened, more fool them too. Um, that's that's my take. What else in the article you didn't Yeah, know? I got a couple of other things. One is, uh, and it's kind of on the same vein, I think, is contract extensions. You know, a lot of uh, talk about, did we put too much faith in the League One side when you did the extensions um, last summer? Okay, so we can pick the bounds of it. Were there mistakes made in some of them? Probably. Um, I was loyal, again. My manager and myself felt it was the right thing to do. It didn't cripple the club. It didn't stop us signing more players. Um, you know, we gave a goalie a contract. He fell out with a manager. He was moved on on loan. Didn't mm-hmm. stop us going and getting another goalie. Um, the other goalie got injured and missed a large portion of the fucking season, as is the way. Um, Dan Butler, contract extension. One of the top four left backs in League One last year. Can play left back, left wing back and left centre back. We felt key part of the club. 26, a year left. It was only right we protect the asset and give the player security because he'd done his job. Um, the younger players, I'm not even going to get into that. Every one of them deserved it. Nathan Thompson, out of contract, had his best season of his life, You know, played all season, was his most durable, and we gave him an extension. And it was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, we've missed, we've lost him for half of the season, so the durability went. But that's not on Nathan. That's just something that happened. Uh, Mark Beavers, he was on uh, very big money in the championship. Um, with a year left. And the way I circumnavigated that to allow more money to make another signing, which was, I think, the Josh Knight signing was, I took Beaver's salary and I cut it to give him an extended contract, which gave yeah. me more cap space of about 150 grand to be able to go out and make the Josh Knight signing wages-wise. So I was trying to rob Peter to pay Paul and do it in a financially prudent way, not to put the club under any pressure. 
Um, who else do I give contract extensions to? Um, is there anyone else in that's controversial? Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt all the extensions were the right ones at the time. Mm-hmm. Some of those players will, will help the football club um, hopefully have a promotion bid next year. It wasn't it wasn't ransom money they were paid. It was money paid for the right reasons. So, you know, okay, have a go at that. What else in the article? Let's go through it bit by bit. Yeah, you know, the other thing I wanted to bring up, and this is, you know, as I've learned both um, observing uh, everything related to, um, you know, yourself and the podcast, also Ryan at City and having seen right, things thrown back in Ryan's face, is it doesn't take much for people to get hold of a, um, a statement that you say oh, and then throw that back in your face all the time. Yeah, of course. This you, you, you put yourself out on social media and you do a podcast. There's going to be stuff there in history that's always going to come back to bite you. You've seen players get banned for stuff they said when they were 12 years old. You know, you, you, you go back through people's tweets, you go back through people's comments, and of course you throw it in their face. I, I understand that. Look, you put yourself out there to be shot down. That's just the way it is when you're in the public eye. I have no problem with people saying, well, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so. Look, Everyone wants to argue, yes, you mentioned the word scapegoat before we came on a podcast. Like, I'm happy to be the scapegoat. No problem at all. That's fine with me. Um, recruitment wasn't perfect, but it was very good. I'm not apologizing for it. Um, it was the best we could do as a football club. I'm not apologizing for the relegation. Um, our fans are wonderful. I said that today in a video. I would never apologize for a relegation. I'm not going to, you know, because at the same time, uh, we'll do our best and we'll try and win a promotion and we'll try and stay in a league like the championship. We fell short. There's many different mitigating factors for it. Um, could we have got better players? No, we tried. We couldn't get them. Um, did we foresee being in a position right now today where I saw a comment earlier about recruitment at left back, just as an example, how poor it was. So we went into the season with Dan Butler. We had two formations we went into the season with, three at the back, and which could change to a 4-2-3-1. They were the two formations the manager wanted recruitment towards. We had Dan Butler... And we had Harrison Burroughs. Dan Butler could play left back, left wing back. Burroughs could go to left wing back. So, and then the backup to that was a young gem called Joe Tomlinson, who was brought in. We were going to put him out on loan for a few months. We couldn't do that due to early injuries. Dan Butler has been the most durable left back in the last 10 years in the Football League. He's averaged 45 to 48 games every season. We didn't foresee in December him getting an injury that would lead to him being out for seven or eight months. Okay. We didn't think uh, Harrison Burroughs would chip a bone on his foot. And, and just to throw some salt on the wounds, Joe Tomlinson's just on his MCL. Mm-hmm. So now you've got all three players in that one position injured. We then got a boy from Middlesbrough who was the young player of the year in the championship that Darren thought would come in and do a job in, in January. Didn't work out, okay? Um, you look at right back. We had Joe Ward, the best right wing back in League One last year, leading assist maker. Again, didn't think Joe. Yes, he's never always been the most durable to play 45 games, but he's also he's been in and out this season, including missing the most important game of the season with a dead leg, and he didn't recover. Okay, And hopefully Grant will make him and a lot of the other players more durable next year. And you can say I'm having a pot shot at him and everyone else. I'm not. I'm telling the truth. They're harsh facts and hard truth. So we had a, another one of our policies was where we had really, really talented young players in certain positions, we would have them back up the main yeah. player of the team. Last year in League One, Harrison Burroughs was that to Butler. Um, at left wing back and Harrison's kicked on this season he's got five assists three goals playing left back left wing back he's not left back but he's at the play there and mm-hmm. he's been one of our best players statistically our biggest assist maker five assists three goals just turned 20 that's a phenomenal season for a fucking yeah. young player. in the championship in the championship okay the other side we had a young kid called Benji who was going to be this year's Harrison he was going to back up Nathan Thompson and Joe Ward right back right wing back Unfortunately, Benji's torn hamstrings in each leg twice this season. All right? Mm-hmm. And that's happened. Nathan Thompson's missed half the season. Joe Ward has missed 30% of the games, I think, if you look at it all statistically. So, again, disaster. You then got the centre-back, and we felt going into the season, with Josh Knight being signed, Ronnie coming to the forefront, you then had Kent, you had Beavers, and you had Thompson who could fill in there. So we felt, okay, we were strong there. We didn't foresee Beavers, who was in the League One team of the year last year, ripping his hamstring and missing four and a half months of the season, and he never got his form back. Because then when he came back, he was in and out. He had another injury then when he was in a pre-match, and then he couldn't come to a game. It was a really important home game a few weeks ago for whatever reason off the pitch. Again, we didn't think those things were going to happen. They did. I'm not making excuses. These are truths and facts I'm trying to explain. The one common denominator last year in League One, the success was, you could name nine of the 11 we played every single week for most of that season. They were durable, they were fit, they were available. If you go to this season, you look at central midfield, 
Jack Taylor. Yes, he's had hamstring issues. We didn't think that happened two times this year. Missed a large part. Ollie Norburn does his ACL. Right? An international duty when we're going into our final 10 games of the season. Most pivotal time. Okay? Who else in there have we had? You know, all I'm saying is, again, a key area. Then you go up front. People are saying, why didn't we sign strikers? Because last year we had Dembele, Jono, and Sammy who played. We felt Marriott, all right, get him fit. And Ricky J. Jones were going to be perfect backup. And there weren't great striker alternatives out there. Yeah. There certainly weren't ones we wanted to take big punts on. Yes, Morton was a punt as a loan in January because of all the issues we had just as insurance. And we really haven't needed him because of Ricky's progression and Joe Taylor's progression. And, and you've seen it now with Jack and, and John O'Fit. They're a lethal partnership mm -hmm. at the championship level. They're scoring goals. Jack Marriott's nearly got 10 championship goals. John O's on his way to 13 or 14. And that's half fit. So the reality is we knew Marriott had injury problems. Again, we didn't think he'd rip a hamstring off a bone. And we certainly didn't think Clark Harris would be in that condition. All those things you can go on about, but that's the truth. We've gone out and signed excess players. Where are you managing them all? Where are yeah. you having them all? So, you know, if we'd had our fitness right, if those players were available, we'd have been comfortable in the championship. Yeah. That's not arrogance. That's not bravado. Look at Blackpool. I'm sure if you look at Blackpool and they're a really well-run club, I guarantee you majority of their teams picked itself most of the season, probably 70%, 80% of it. We haven't had that. And even this week, the most important game of the week against Forest, we're in a great run of form. We're, we're doing really well. Joe Ward, pivotal part of the way we play. And, you know, we're, we're having to suddenly play Josh Knight at right back. Because Ward, he's got, a, you know, he's got a dead leg on Monday. He's a bit of a virus during the week. And he's not available on the Saturday. Mm -hmm. You know, and these things hurt us, you know, and, and it's we're already decimated, you know, not to mention losing him. I've said it about the goalkeeper. Then Joel Randall, you know, Randall was brought in. You've seen enough of him. You know how talented mm -hmm. he is. Yeah. He can play left or right in a 4 2 3 1. He could play in behind the strikers playing in a, in a three at the back, you know, and it was a, it was the formation, a 3 4 1 2, whatever it might be. And again, we didn't foresee some of the issues that young boys had all season. So uh, I'd love to say, it's all down to one reason, the recruitment. Recruitment wasn't good enough. No, if you write it all down and you go through it, and I've got a report here, we have been decimated most of the season. We have been decimated most of the season, and we haven't had the players available. You can write off the loan players in January. Again, I don't want to do loans. My manager wanted these players on loan, okay? You know, we went out and bought Fuchs. We tried to buy Fuchs last summer. And we brought it into January because he was out of contract in the summer. He was a good signing. He was a very good addition. And our people already want him. He's one of the best holding midfielders in the championship already based on our statistics. So the recruitment on that side, permanence, has been very good. You know, the loan's very sketchy. And again, I'm not sidetracking the blame. That was a case of we haven't got any fullbacks. We've got to go get two on loan. Yeah. You know, we've always said in the pod as well that you can't do your due diligence on loan players. You've got to take no. who's available sometimes. No, and correct. sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Correct. And we got turned down by other options as well. You know, and, and that's just the way it went. And unfortunately, nobody wanted to come to us in January in a permanent, bar Fuxi, you know, who's very, very loyal because we tried to sign him in the summer and he wanted to come then. Nobody else wanted to come because they could see the battle we were in. So they didn't want to come to a club that was going down to League One. So it was a really, really difficult circumstance. But the reality is, look, it hasn't been good enough. It's, it's, the only thing good enough has been the support. Our fans have been the only thing good enough this year. And the staff and the work off the pitch and the academy. That work has been good enough. Regards to our first team, our performances, our fitness, our injuries, behind the scenes, call recruitment out if you want. None of that has been where it usually is. And those little inches give us as a club usually the extras we need. Go back to, like I said last season, 90% of the first 11 played 40 plus games. And there's no shock and no surprise we were one of the best teams in the country. And we just couldn't get to the stage where we could get them out on the pitch. And Grant McCann said to me when he came in, he just couldn't believe how short we were from a physical and fitness perspective. Because when you go into this league, and I could pull up a document I wrote last April and May when we were getting promoted. And it was about the importance of the championship. And at the top of that document was physical, physicality and sports science and the fitness, meaning we had to be stronger, fitter than ever before going into this season. It was imperative. We were in tip-top condition. And I even wrote in there about extra staff, extra things we needed to do. That was key and fundamental. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, and again, no blame, it just didn't happen. It didn't get executed, and we had a disaster. And it's caught up with us all season. 
And when you see the manager who's come in, fundamentally key to him is fitness. The stuff he has his team doing. You know, before he came in, we would have, after a game on Saturday, we'd have Sunday off, and then Monday was a warm down day. Well, our current manager, Sunday might be off, but Monday certainly not warm down mm-hmm. day. You know, these you're up against physical he, specimens. He was, I mean, he would he'd go to, all the way down to nutrition, wouldn't he? So in his everything, previous everything, club, everything. he'd have the chef. Listen, you know. Our chef has been given different menus to start. Look, everything's been changed. And again, not a slight from before. This is fact I'm trying to explain. And our players are fitter. And it's no accident we're more competitive away from home. It's no accident we're more competitive in games of pressing. You can see it, but it's just caught up too late with us. If we had another five games to go, we'd stay up. That's where we are. So in that event, you can go, are you good enough to stay in the championship? I'm telling you now, if you got excited by the last few games and, and us competing against Nottingham Forest at our place where we really should have had a point if not win, you can see those little building blocks that are in place. Our players will be different in the summer. And there's no accident last year that the fitness and sports science that we got away with last year, you couldn't get away with in the champ as a level of player. We got away with it in League One. We got it because our players were so good. We got away with it in League One. So, again, the autopsy, everything you want to do, the blame. I'm going to do a thing with Phil on Thursday at the football club, and I'll go into it a bit more if he wants or if the fans want. But, you know, I'm happy to take the blame for everything. If you need your scapegoat, have at it. Not a problem at all. I, I, I've always said I know when the, the temperature in the room is changing. And maybe I'm getting that sense now after 15 years. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that... Um... We talked in the summer last year as well about the reality of players will be willing to come to a League One promotion battle that are not willing to come to a relegation, what they perceive as being a championship relegation battle. So it'll be interesting, you know, as you look forward, the quality of players you can probably attract ironically is as good, if not better, as a challenging League One side as it is somebody who's just been promoted to the championship. The football club's challenge is a few things. One is, obviously, there's a massive financial uh, disparity now dropping down. And there's a cost to that. So one is, you've got to recoup that. Two is, there'll be certain players will be highly coveted and you're not going to be able to keep them. So they're going to go. And then three is, with the 80% you left over, you're going to need three, four, maybe five signings in, in, in certain areas, key areas, to blend in with what's already there. And what's already there is, is the bones of the brilliant champ- or League One squad. Um, and you get all those players fit and rocking and rolling. If you can, if Grant McCann can pick the same 8, 9, 10, 11 players, 7, 8, 9 times out of 10, they're going to be, Peter United's going to have an incredibly good team in League One. And with the young players are going to be even better, it's going to be a very, very good team. So that's the challenge. That's that's what's in front of the football club. And and I've got no doubt in my mind they'll be one of the, one of the more exciting and competitive teams in League One regardless of what's happened this season. So it'll be an interesting summer. Yeah, so so what's, you know, looking forward to the summer, what's, what does the next, what are we, we're towards the end of April, what does he, between here and pre-season kind of look like in preparing for League One? Um, I think it looks like, you know, the manager's going to have his end-of-season assessment with the players. I think he gives them a plan. I think they're getting a three-week plan. They'll get a break for a couple of weeks. Then they'll have to, on their own time, because they're all for a good period of time, they get three weeks where they've got to, get back in shape. They cannot come back and weigh in like the players did last summer. We had so much in the red zone, it was embarrassing. And I think they know what's going to happen if they do come back in that condition. Then they're going to have a few weeks, a couple of weeks training at home. And then the club goes to Portugal at the start of July, playing two very good teams out in Portugal. And then there's a few games sprinkled around July and then good to go. I think we're getting one pre-season home friendly in for the first time in three years. The pitch is all done. That's getting fixed as well. Um, at the end of July, before it all starts again. So I think it's going to be a very aggressive, reactive summer to what's gone on. I think there's going to be, from the players' point of view, and I'm hoping this is the case, there's going to be a big reaction from them to get over the disappointment. And again, a little bit like what happened when we spoke about the vengeance tour after the point, after the vote, that the players have got to have a chip on their shoulder this season about what they've... And they've played a big part in this season. The players can't get away from the fact that they're played a part in that relegation. So if they want to make up for the relegation, the quick way to forget bad news is to produce good news. How do you assess League One? Uh, you know, or what what it looks like. You know, as everyone, League everyone League. goes on about. You know, my God, you're going to have so many big clubs. I've said throughout my 15 years, every time we've got promoted from League One, we've been up against Leeds, we've been up against Leicester, we've been up against Southampton, we were up against that Brighton team that were unbelievable like under Gus Poyet. We were up against Sheffield Wednesday. We were up against, um, who else was in it? Sunderland, you know, last year, Charlton. All those big clubs, Ipswich, they're always been there. 
It won't make any difference next year, except you're going to have two other clubs, well, particularly Derby, another monster club going into League One. You're going to have some good teams coming up from League Two. Everyone gets carried away, and I said this during the pandemic when the vote came in in the following year. Clubs are big in name. It's always going to come down to who is the better team and who recruits the best. And I use the word recruit before people start laughing and going on about recruiting again. You know, that's going to be key, particularly a club the size of Peterborough United always competing against those clubs. We're also going to have, obviously, the Cambridgeshire Derby for the first time in 20 years. And we're going to have Northampton probably back in there. So there's going to be some big gates. There's going to be some big atmospheres. Um, and, that, and that's going to be interesting to see. But it'll be a hell of a competitive league, as usual. Um, it's like everything else. Only three teams get to go up. So, uh, you, you know, who knows? Who who who'd you put your money on? So all I know is, is that my 15 years, we, we got out of it, I think, three times in nine years we were in it. Yeah, I certainly know all about big big named clubs languishing in uh, in lower divisions and how you, the name of your club and the number of bums you have on seats means oh, nothing when it comes to the league table. We're going to get on to Bradford now in a second. Is there anything else you want to dissect about the scapegoat here? Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, sure I'm sure there's lots of people who think I've missed things and they'll be throwing at us. Um, oh, but throw, throw them out there. I mean, you know, anything with regards to Peter United or you know me. No, you know, um, my partners, you know. Oh, I want to look. Um, I want to look forward at this point rather than looking back. And just a, a comment about the transfer market. You know, do you do you see the transfer market unfreezing um, in the summer? I mean, it's, it's kind of been a strange market we've talked about the last twelve months or so post pandemic. Do you foresee any changes on that front? I think it'll get better. I think you know it won't be as bad as last year. I think it'll definitely get better. You'd like to think so. Um, I think there are you know. There are some big clubs will come down. Some big clubs are going to go up. Hopefully, some money will rinse through the football league. Um, there were a lot of clubs who didn't spend last summer because of the pandemic, and hopefully, they're coming out of that side of things now with all full crowds back. Um, so, I think it'll be an interesting transfer market. And uh, you know, and, and as usual, at Peter, it'll be interesting in our place because there will be, regardless of the relegation, there will be players that will be highly coveted by Premier League clubs and Championship clubs. So, you know, as usual, you navigate around that and you you, you do what you can. So. But I've got no doubt in my mind that the squad that starts the first game at the start of August, the end of July for Grant McCann and Peter B. United will be one of the favourites to win the title. Mm-hmm. You kind of alluded to it earlier, you know, about a challenge the club has is to recoup the financial difference between the championship and League One and that sales may play a part in that. You know, do you have any expectation in terms of numbers of players that you think will leave or you know are you willing to put any names out there yet that are expressing no, interest? Players, players, there, there are players out of contract will go um there are players that will be put on the transfer list and they're the ones that you know you know you there won't be the manager's plans yeah and then there'll be players that will be sold for a big money um which is just the way it's always been at our club um and it's just gonna the way it's gonna be this summer it'll be no different and then there'll be players that will be bought and brought in because mm-hmm. uh, the club's always financially bought players and um, that you know that will never, well, hopefully it won't change even when I'm gone. Um, maybe it will. Yeah, so, well, that's always yeah. been your philosophy. And and actually that brings, brings an interesting question because you've always paid money mm. and then you're seeing comments about, well, this million pound price tag, does it put too much pressure on the players and things like that? Like, do you, <laughs> it's used as an excuse, isn't it? It's used as like a... There isn't one player I paid a fee for that I regret this year. Mm. Not one. Some people go, you're mad. I go, um, Josh Knight, been our, one of our best players since January. Two championship clubs already won him. Um, you know, who else did I buy in there? Joe Tomlinson, outstanding at Swindon until his injury, will be a phenomenal player for us next year. 100 grand. Um, Poku, 250 grand. People can see that already. 20 years old, money well spent. Um, Randall, it will turn out to be an absolute bargain. Um, Grant McCann said that to me during the week. He can't believe how good he is. Now he's seen him in training. We feel we've got to the bottom of his issues and we think him settling down and whatever else, he'll be a revelation in League One. Um, so, you know, who else do we pay money for? Uh, Yando Fuchs, 100 odd, 150 grand. Uh, you know, you tell me one of those players that was bad recruit, not one of them. They're all going to be good players for the club and they're going to be assets that will accrue very good transfer income in the future. No doubt in my mind whatsoever. All right. Well, I'll I'll leave the uh, the post mortem there for for one week <laughs> at least. Um, uh, thank you for being gracious enough, and uh, you know I think that, like we said at the beginning, there's a lot. Of, people get very emotional when things like relegation happen, and and you forget everything that came before it. So I mean, that's yeah. as an outside observer. That's what I see is like 
Uh, it's just, I, I talked about it off mic beforehand. We mentioned it here a little bit. It's just everyone's looking for a scapegoat and you're kind of that target. Uh, of course. Look, I've, I've got a big couple of weeks coming up. I've always said I'll listen to the fans. And the mass majority, of course, they're with me. But there is a, a percentage now that's getting bigger and bigger that don't want me at the football club. So I have to spend the next couple of weeks thinking about that in context. And, you know, they're asking me to hand over. I'm not handing anything over. My, my, my stake in the club is, is very valuable to my partners. So I have to have a think the next couple of weeks, you know, whether or not it's better for the club if I'm not here. Um, and talk to my partners about that in Vegas where we have a big management meeting in May and the manager's coming over and Barry's coming over and sit down and, and discuss what's going to happen for the football club going forward. You know, whether I'm, and that's not me threatening to leave or anything else. I have to look at what's best for me, what's best for the football club. Well, the one thing I'll never do is leave the club in a bad way. And, you know, I'm telling the fans and everyone listening that come July the 30th or whenever the first game is, and it's earlier this season, that will be a potentially a title winning squad in place in League One. And that work will start now. And that work will be finished by the time they go to Portugal. And by the time they play at the start of August, they'll be good to go. All right. Well, let's uh, leave Peter B. United for let's a, move on to Bradford. Another week. And, let's um, move on. What did I say? Moving on to Bradford. Yes. Um, and for us, you know, we've um, not had great results of late. Uh, I think that, you know, most of the squad have probably been told what their status is going into next season. Um, what's, what's Sparky's record overall? Um, I haven't got it in front of me in terms of wins, losses, and draws. It feels like it's... Um, I can remember three wins. So it's probably like this. It's probably across the board, you know, like three wins, three draws, three losses, something like that. And I'm sure I'll go and look at the stats and it's completely different. But that's what it feels like. <laughs> you know, it just feels like he's brought a different, um, he's brought a different attitude and uh, he's trying to, you know, do new things with the team. And okay. is the team good enough to do that? I don't think so. You've um, seen enough. You like but, him. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, you've got to feel. You have this feeling that you've got someone who knows what he's doing. Um, so you you think he's going to turn you into a promotion winner next year? I think he's got a really good chance to do so. Um, as is always the case, it's all about um, recruitment, and I think on our side, a lot of it's going to be about loans. You know how how can he recruit uh, using his contacts higher up the leads leagues from a loan perspective? Um, you know, he's talked about that and recognizing, you know, all the things that you don't really want to have to do that because you're developing other teams' players, um, however, needs must. Um, right. And, you know, how his focus is going to be on players that have already been out on loan before. So he doesn't want to go with people who haven't been out on loan in League One, League Two. Um, so so give, me, give me this as a Bradford fan. Mm-hmm. We've got a couple of games left. What are the five things you need to see happen over the next eight weeks for Bradford to be ready to win that league next summer? We need a complete clear out of, of players. You know, we've got a lot of players that are uh, coming to the end of their contracts. And, you know, there's a lot of debate right now, as there always is. You know, are those players good enough to stay? Are they not good enough to stay? My general opinion is that they're, you know, players who are brought in as first team players are probably good enough to stay as squad players. However, you wouldn't want to give them a first team wage to do so. So, you know, there's probably players that I would offer squad wages to to keep that to that I think would be as I say good backups but he needs to really go through that first team and rebuild the team um even players who have played well in a part team I don't think are good enough to play in a Mark Hughes team okay you know and do, you, do you think there's any value in any of the players you're going to to sell is there any is there any transfer fees in there no you know the the best two players that we've got from a value market value perspective are both out of contract so that's Paddy O'Connor and Elliot Watt. You don't have options on them? No. Fuck. So, you know, they'll, I don't know. I say they'll most likely be gone, but I don't know that for a fact because, you know, we become a more attractive proposition with Mark yeah. Hughes in charge than we would have done um, ordinarily. So who knows where they will end up, you know, whether that's staying or going, I'm not sure. But we don't have any uh, contracted players of value ironically i would have probably said a year ago reese staunton um you know a young kid would be but he's just been kind of sidelined and i think he's had his own issues as well Um, so he needs to have a really good uh summer and really show that he wants it and um you know and i think that there is an asset there but not to sell this summer to raise any, any cash to reinvest 
But as usual, I'm sure the Bradford fans are buying 18,000 season tickets, <laughs> coming out in force, filling the club's coffers and fucking, even after another awful season in League Two, will be a bit like the posh fans that, you know, yeah. we know every year how many posh fans are going to renew. They're just incredibly loyal. Yeah. You know, COVID, non-COVID, fucking relegations, promotions, you know, around that figure, those same hardcore posh fans are just bleeding the club. You know, I mean, in a good way, bleeding blue. Yeah, you know? yeah, right. I mean, it's crazy. We had, I know that Tramia brought a good away following, but we had 17 and a half thousand at home to Tramia when we were 16, 17 on the game. table. Nothing game. Yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, un fucking believable. And I guess, having seen our stadium filled fill so many times this season, yes, with big away crowds and whatever else, still the atmosphere that brought out our fans, you mm-hmm. know, was being. You know, and I'm, I'm hoping because there's so many good clubs in the Cambridgeshire Derby and Northampton, we're still going to have, you know, eight, nine, ten of those, cl- you know, big crowds next year. Yeah. You know what I mean? Keep the keep the attendance growing. And and you know, all you need is a, you need to get on a good a good run and build momentum. And people, when you're winning, people will come and watch you. You know, I mean, people just need the feel good factor. And I feel like with us, when we were in the final throws of Derek Adams, you know, we'd lost a lot of the crowd, a lot of loyal people. And I mean, if that's one thing that they've done with bringing Mark Hughes back is um, just brought that passion back um, and that interest. And even though the results haven't necessarily followed, you can see that they're trying to do new things. He's talking very intelligently in in his interviews around the things that he's trying to do and the things that he thinks they need to fix. You know, he's talking a lot about technical ability of players um, and, you know, the importance of that. And there's, you know, just you feel as though he knows what he's doing. He just doesn't have the tools to do it right now. And that's what his summer is going to be all about. Have you, and ultimately, you, that's what he'll be judged on. Have you spoke to Ryan recently at all about how he's getting on and how the work relationship is? Um, as far as I know, things are going really well. You know, um, you know, Mark has, you know, he just wants to get his head down and work. Um, which is, uh, you know, how he's kind of approached it. He, it sounds like, you know, from the conversations I've had, he just doesn't like the, he doesn't need all the big like commotion and, and kerfuffle and all that stuff. It's like, okay, I want to get to work, um, you know, and there's a job to be done. And that's right. been his philosophy so far. Fair play. So there was no Bradford or Peterborough players in the teams of the year last night, was there, in the, the football <laughs> awards? <laughs> yeah, probably some former um, posh, posh players and former Bradford players. There was. There was. As is always was. the way. There was. I was thinking, like, Matty Stevens, I think, was in the League Two team. Yeah, he year. was. He just did his ACL, didn't he? God bless him. Yeah, he's ACL. Otherwise, he would have won the Golden Boot and uh, would have yeah. been another posh Golden Boot in there. Um, Mo Weiss had got a bad injury for MK Dons. He was having a good season for them. Obviously, Ivan's flying for Brentford. And, mm. uh, yeah, so, you know, the goals live on, even when they leave the club, you know. It just shows that recruitment with some of these players. <laughs> you know, and it's it's interesting. So one of our old players, Tim Dieng, got in the uh, League Two. I saw that, I saw um, that yeah. Yeah, uh, excellent. Team of the year. And, you yeah. know, he went down with Southend last year. And yes. I think yes. sometimes sometimes we have this, like, again, superiority complex of, oh, you know, we're, we're too big for a club, for a player like that. Well, no, we're not really. You know, you see that he's did really well for Exeter this year. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Uh, because we were poo-pooing him. Or certain, you know, fragments of the support were poo-pooing the idea of him um, coming on board last during the summer because it was mooted. He's obviously done very well for himself, you know, this year. Players can surprise you, you know. And, and, and I guess, again, it comes down to sometimes when players are young, you know, they have that sticky period and they're not great, but they come again. And, you know, our policy's always been, we will go out and get the strays, the waifs, the gems who've been discarded and had a couple of rough years and then polish them up. And Ivan Tony on loan nine times. You know, there's your examples. So, you know, fans have to be careful. Don't always write off somebody because they do surprise you and kick you in the bollocks. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, if you asked me before what are the five things that Bradford fans would want to see between now and the start of the season. Like, what would you want to see as a, um, as a Bradford fan in that situation? Like, what would you be looking for? I'd want to see a, a, a great preseason plan. I want to see, you know, I want I want clarity from ownership and from the manager that what is the aim next year? Are you going to build a title winning squad? You know, you've got that big fan base who expects something. How are you going to do it? Are you changing your policy of, of going about that? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is it going to be a young and hungry sprinkled with experience? What is the plan? What's the blueprint for the next three years? Yeah. You know, if, if, if you've got a manager like Mark Hughes, you know, is the expectation, like I've always said, back-to-back promotions. Yeah. So that starts now. So right now, I certainly wouldn't want to see Hughes playing players that he doesn't want next year. Mm-hmm. 
shelve them, move them on. Next couple of games, use the young players, the players are still on a contract, and start picking what you want to do. Formations, he's, players, and spots. He's been you trying know, to play, play some players out of their traditional position to see if they can um, do it in other positions. Yeah, I, I understand that. I'm, I'm not big on square pegs and round holes. I hate that. So, you, you, you know, you, you should know by training by now whether yeah. or not a right back can play in central midfield or vice versa. So, you know, I want the CEO to come out and say, I've got my list from the manager. This is what we're doing and this is what we've got to go and get. Not naming the players, but, you right. know, we're, we're going to need eight new players. We've got to put it together. As a Bradford fan, I'd want most of them in the building by the middle of June. Mm-hmm. One of the things that's always been really beneficial for us in building promotion teams is early business, is getting everyone in settled. Yes, you're always going to get one or two in the last couple of weeks that are going to come in, but get the majority, the, the spine of your team right in time for preseason, for camp. That's key. Now, are you able to do that if you're building a team around Lonies or use, heavily using Lonies into I, your team? I hate, it. I hate the Lone thing, which is ironic since right. we got 19 loans in January. I hate the Lone thing. And again, it just shows it just never works. Um, we've got a load of loans hanging around the building, you know, on our payroll till June. And it's mm-hmm. just, you know, the. the they just, with all due respect to them, they're, they're not in the battle like the players who are contracted to your club a lot of the time. So um, I'm not a fan of the loan thing. There's enough free business out there for Bradford to sign players they don't need to loan them. Now, if you're going to get one or two, totally understood. Yeah, Bristol Rovers have had a couple of very good loan Yeah, there. I mean, we they they played us off the park with their loan ease. Um, yeah, and, and, uh, and they've... And Mansfield as well. Mansfield Swindon a few years ago did it in League One. I'm all right with one or two. I don't like six or seven. So one or two, it's fine. We got promoted with, I think, Reese Brown, and I can't remember who else was in there. It was one or two. That's all we had. And, we, and again, there were players we were going to try and sign permanently. Um, you know, and, and that, that's a big part of it. So definitely come out and say what it's going to be. Well, it's going to be five loans, and then it's going to be free. Tra- you know, whatever it is, be transparent, be honest. Maybe the owner, you know, maybe have a bit of a Zoom link with him with fans. Maybe try and repair the bridges if he isn't selling the club if he's staying maybe come out and be a little bit more together because obviously as i've seen with toxicity it can just it can infect things it can make things worse and and you don't need that you know and 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 it's time for that great club to rise again you know where do you stand in league two because we've had different managers with different philosophies on goalkeepers Mm. you know do you do you put your money into the best goalkeeper you can buy or do you Go and find a loanee who's going to do a job, and they may not be the best, but you know maybe I'm going to put my budget somewhere else. Yeah, I think I think without being disrespectful to goalies, it's the one area you can be cheap in a team if you get loans in. And mm-hmm. there's been enough loans the last few years of one Golden Gloves and whatever else playing in League Two and League One. And I don't think you could have an issue going out and, and allocating seven hundred pounds a week for a Premier League youngster to come in, right. capable of doing the job. If the rest of your team's built well and you get a good young goalie and who can play with his feet or the way you want to play. You shouldn't have an issue there, you know, at the end of the day. But you, a big part of your budget really should. Having learned to champ, it's the other way. You need a really good code in the champ. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, and I've definitely learned that lesson that, you know, in, in the championship, you need a really, really good goalie. And it's not an area that you could, unless you've got a really good relationship with a, a Man United, a Liverpool or whatever, where you're getting a big favour, um, you know, and then you can get an extraordinary goalie on loan. But I think, yeah, in League Two, you can get away with a, a, a cheapy loanee to allow your budget to yeah. go into defence and midfield or attack or on that 20 season goal score that you need. And Bradford haven't had for a long time. No, hopefully, we'll, hopefully, part of uh, maybe we may end up be uh, rolling Mark Hughes out to be our 20 goal a striker. Yeah. Sorry, 20 goal a season striker at this That's rate. But good. we've missed a goal scorer for a long time, you know, yeah. hence, I think, where we are. Yeah, uh, you're talking about your top scorers. Your top scorers still got a lot more goals than our top scorers do, you know, and that's in the relegation side. There lies the problem. Mm-hmm. There lies the issue. Um, let's move on just for a couple more minutes on uh, uh, elsewhere, and I don't want to go through kind of all the leagues and everything like that, but there's a couple of things I want to get your opinion on. Uh, sure. The first one's Everton. Um, Everton dropped into the uh, the bottom three now with Burnley um, turning around a couple of wins, which I think is. I mean, it's pretty desperate times for Burnley. We talked right at the beginning when they that takeover happened about the need for them to stay in the Premier League, um, the troubles that may come, acom- may come across them if they don't. Um, can the unthinkable happen, do you think, at Everton on yeah. the way down? I think Burnley are together. I think even without Sean Bice, with Sean Bice, they're together. And I just think they've been through this so many times. None of those Everton players have been through this. And I think... 
when you go through this, five games to go, the heat of the battle. Um, I'm I'm not optimistic for Everton. I think they go down. So um, if they if they don't if they don't get four points from the next two games, they go down. In my opinion. So yeah, that's going to be interesting. Everton in the Championship. Wow, wow, wow. You keep saying so, it's not. It can't happen. It can't happen. And here we are now. They're only a few games to go in the bottom three. Hey, historically a, a traditionally famous club. Sunderland's a massive club. Look where mm-hmm. they are. You know, this happens. There's so many big clubs. And, you know, with the finances, the money that's been put into Everton over a few years, wow. I mean, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, I, I saw a stat, uh, I think it was on US TV, that said that um, Everton has spent more money in the transfer market than Liverpool, mm-hmm. you know, in the last, I don't know what yeah. it was, six, seven years. Yeah. That spend is about 70, 80 million difference. Mm-hmm. So, again, you know, one club obviously has been operated in a different level. Um, and fair play, I've criticised the Liverpool ownership group about strength of squad and whatever, and they've addressed it. And they've addressed it really well. And they've addressed it with three, four players, not six or seven. Um, so the, 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 But again, I've always said the manager makes the difference. Put Jurgen Klopp in charge of that Everton team. They're not for relegation. Now at the top of the, top of the table, there's still only a point between the well, two. Like if you're, you're putting your, uh, your car on uh, the, the winner of the Premier League, who are you choosing? Man City get to the Champions League final, I choose Liverpool. If Man City lose to Real Madrid in the Champions League semi final, Man City win the league. I think if they get to the final, all concentration goes to winning the Champions League. So I think, and that gives us a chance. I worry, you know, Liverpool are going to play Tottenham still. Um, and I think who else in the league have we got to play? I think do we have to play Chelsea still? I'm not sure if we played them twice. I mean, I, I look at it and I go, it's tilted towards Man City. You can see them in all five games. But if they get to the Champions League final, just the one trophy that's eluded them there. So, um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Look, it's it's a Herculean effort from Liverpool to be on four fronts with three weeks of the season left. Just unbelievable. What's really key now is making sure that if they don't win the league, win the FA Cup and win the Champions League. To come out of all of this with just the League Cup will be the biggest disappointment and hangover going into the summer ever. So what has to drive them on is win those trophies as best you can. If you can't get the cha- if you can't get the league title we all want, get those other two trophies in the bag, and you've got a treble of your own. Now, do you think this is peak Liverpool, or do you think no. they continue next season? Oh, no, I, I, I think the owners are learning. I think they're giving Klopp what he needs. I think now the younger players are getting better. I think there'll be one or two changes next season. Um, I, I think now the way they've re-energized their front line with the signing of Diaz, and even after this season, I think yeah, Liverpool are looking very, very strong. Um, you know, I, I think oof, I'm not sure. You know, I don't know how much, how longer, how long Klopp's got left because he's one of them who said he'll move on after a period of time. But we're going to miss this Guardiola Klopp uh, battle, that's for sure. The best two teams for the last five years, bar none. Um, and the last thing I just want to touch on is uh, in the Championship, and it's Sheffield United. So yeah. reported takeover bid of 115 million pounds. Um, did that number surprise you? No, I think ex Premier League recently they still have some parachute payments. They have four years, they got two years left or three years left after this year. I think the guy who owns has always said he never, even though he was an Arab, a wealthy Arab, he was never like a sheikh, right? With the mega wealth, um, and you know, I think an American wants to buy it. Is he a fun guy? Um, I don't know. Interesting. It'll be interesting to see how it all pans out. Uh, are they still in the mix for the top six? I'll stop looking at the um, Let me have a look. I think the last time I looked, um, let's see where the they best, are. Better. Yeah, they are sixth right now. Two games to right. go, three right. points clear in the playoffs. We all said they're the best squad in the championship. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and obviously, fair play to Heckenbottom. He's, he's got them in there after a really right. shitty start of the season under the previous guy. So, it's going to be interesting. I fancy Forrest to go up with Bournemouth and, uh, and Fulham. Yeah, it looks like, uh, and Luton, you know, hats off. Oh. It's not uh, not a deliberate pun, but hats off to Luton for being in the playoffs. I mean, it's a fantastic one of my favorite people in football. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy to see them doing so well. And listen, if Luton got up to the Premier League, fucking hallelujah, brilliant, you know. Cause we you imagine everyone them. coming to come Kenilworth Road. Yeah, but you know what? We love those stories. Oh, yeah. So, you, you, you know, you always want a club like that in the Premier League. If Burnley came out, you want a Luton in there. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it, it'll be very interesting. Look, it's going to be really fascinating playoffs. After playing Forest recently, I'm telling you now, the players they have, yeah. they're primed to get to the Premier League. Cooper's got, he's getting a tune out of them. 
the 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 resilient defensively. They've got attacking flair all over the place. You know, the wing backs, the full backs, the way they play. You know, I, I really, really fancy Nottingham Forest. So I'll be amazed if they and Huddersfield obviously are again. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, surpassing all the odds. And I mean, they were one of the favourites of relegation. Yeah, yeah, no, but everyone forgets they were in the Premier League two years yeah. ago. I mean, we're not talking about a small club here, so it's going to be interesting. And then League One, my God, I think eighty nine points top, eighty six points two teams in second. I think we've got we got fifty grand on MK Don's going up from the Mo Issa deal, and we got twenty five grand if Plymouth make the playoffs. Another 25, they go up. We've got some nice little add-ons in there, you know, along the way. You know, we've made money already in Matty Stevens with his goals and mm-hmm. getting promoted from Forest Green. Obviously, if Brentford stay in, so they're all nice little add-ons and help with the club and what we've got to deal with this summer. Yeah, Forest Green were uh, confirmed uh, promotion at the weekend. Yeah, they've been um, actually the best teams in that league by mile. Oh, yeah. And Bristol Rovers, obviously, for what they've done, you know, after their horror start and everything else, fair play to them. And and then special mention Northampton. You know they they always seem to bounce back strongly mm-hmm. whenever they go down from League One to League Two. It kind of drives me crazy how whenever we get relegated to League Two, it takes us five six years to get back. And you see all these other teams coming down and bouncing back up again. And uh, you're wondering like, what are they doing different? Yeah, no, no, hundred percent. But yeah, Northampton have cracked the code. So they, yeah. they you know, they look. It's going to be interesting. And then the playoffs. So. It'll be an interesting end of the season. I'll be watching with one eye. I'm not really bothered, but uh, I'll be yeah. still watching. <laughs> Um, well, let's uh, let's call that a day for the pod uh, this week. I think uh, we haven't talked about uh, the rest of the season, but maybe a couple of weeks' time we can do another uh, one that kind of wraps up where we are at that let's, point. Let's, let's do an end of season one. We can call this part of H is this, and we call this the end is nigh. You know? Yes. So, yeah, you know, for the podcast. So thank you to the listeners. Apologies for being a little bit sporadic when we've come out with the different episodes and um you know, we'll speak to you in a couple of weeks when the season's all done and dusted. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Dara, as ever. And we'll talk to everybody again soon. Take care. Mm-hmm.